On today's episode of the show, we give a Flyville 25 update discussing two top prospects you need to watch for while also evaluating the two most recent Cardinal commits coming up on today's episode of Locked on Global. You are Locked on Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? Happy Tuesday. Welcome into this recruiting special episode of the Locked on Louisville podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. Today's episode brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Joining me for a special recruiting episode is the Locked on Podcast Network National Recruiting Analyst, Brian Smith. Brian, long time no see, man. How have things been going for you? Uh, very busy right now. I hear you. <laughs> uh, middle of June is about mm-hmm. as busy as it gets. Uh, starting next week, the commitments of why. It's been a whirlwind type of month for Louisville. Louisville's gotten four commitments this month alone. They might not be done um, adding this month. We'll talk about two prospects that could pull the trigger on a Louisville commitment. We will discuss the two most recent Cardinal commitments, both from the state of Ohio. Brian, I do want to ask you your opinion on this matter to start out with. There's a good portion of Louisville fans that have become – um, more and more uh, just unmoved by what Brahm is doing on the high school trend. Now, obviously, it seems like his MO recruiting for Louisville at the moment is all about the portal. A lot of the NIL budget dedicated to the portal. It seems like people believe that high school recruiting has taken a backseat to that. This will probably be the second class in a row with less than 20 members in the class total. Not very many highly rated players. Do you think that those – concerns are valid for a program that really has never recruited at that high level to begin with? A couple of things. Uh, Number one, what does the word fan, what is it short for? Fanatic. Uh, When was the last time Louisville was an elite program for more than like a year or so when a certain guy who's now in Baltimore was there? Never have been. Exactly. What are, what are realistic expectations year to year? Mm -hmm. Eight and four to 10 and two. Honestly, and I know Louisville fans are throwing things at the TV. Too bad. That's the way it is. Until you prove otherwise, you're going to get nothing but three-star kids. They didn't – I checked yesterday. that I don't think they signed a four-star player by 24-7. I forget which network in the last class. Brom can recruit, too. He is a good recruiter. Mm -hmm. It's the program, not the coach. And I know everybody's really throwing things now. It's just the way it is. So either he goes to the portal and gets kids and takes a lot of risk, which there is, or they're going to be a team that's left behind. So they need a guy, though, to step up and be a dude to kind of give them some cachet again. And I'm not saying you're going to get, you know, a future NFL MVP, but, you know, you need somebody to do that. And he's a really good football coach. I mean, they made it to the ACC final last year. (laughs) Did anybody really think that outside of the Louisville fan base before the season started? Not really, man. (laughs) Kind of like the dark horse. And I remember, you know, hammering home the point of like, look, man, this Louisville team really could make some noise. But the national perspective was a little bit lower than I. I, Brian, I feel like a lot of this is sort of skewed because of that 23 class with Pierce Clarkson, Aaron Williams, Dan Quan Clark, and Adonijah Green. I, I think people want that to be the new norm. And you really can't have your cake and eat it too. If you want great portal classes year in, year out, there's only so much money to go around. So obviously by you know process of elimination, the, the high school class is going to receive a little bit less attention. It's going to be more so guys built up towards having a possible uh, group that can grow together and, and that can uh, grow exactly. under Rob. I think that most programs, whether they want to – fans want to look at it or not, there's only about 10 schools that get the elite elite kids. It's just mm-hmm. true. Louisville is not one. You need to redshirt, redshirt, and redshirt. Kids leave, kids leave. It is mm-hmm. always going to be a volatile school, I think, except for Colorado. Who I don't even know what Dion's doing. I can't even define that. Mm-hmm. Louisville had about the most transfers of any school in the country. He's not yeah. going to get a load of good players from the state of Kentucky. There's not enough players. I'm from Indiana. There's not a ton there either. So you're not going to go into Ohio and grab the kids Ohio State once. I guarantee you. You lost one one today. Jake Cook um, just kind of got committed – or committed – got nudged up to a four-star level on 24-7 sports. 
Ohio State comes knocking. He's 20 minutes away from Columbus. Yes. He commits pretty much immediately. And I try to tell people, look, there's some of these – if you're going to recruit the upper echelon or try to recruit the upper echelon, you have to understand that you are going to lose out on some guys. Yeah, you're probably going to lose out on the vast majority. I mean, even Michigan gets their butt kicked by Ohio State in the state of Ohio. That fan base is a cult. So right. good luck. Um, they're going to have to pick their spots. And Brom is an excellent evaluator, an excellent recruiter. And right now, I think he has to hit the portal. I don't think that's what he wants to do. I really don't. Uh, everybody would rather just take the high school kids and an occasional Juco and just develop everybody, but he's not getting the kids he wants. So what options do you have? So uh, Clarkson, et cetera, aside, I don't think that's going to be the norm. They need that one guy though, that hits the home run for them. That makes them cool to go play for uh, I quarterback would be great, but it needs to be somebody. Do you think Mason Mims could be that guy? Mason is so underrated. It's hilarious. And he's from Oxford. I mean, I live in Alabama now. Oxford's a good program. He's un unbelievably accurate. He fits what Brom does to a T. He, he reminds me of the Brom. Like, how do they play? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's funny. If you get kids like that every year, you'll be fine. Now, the question is, can you keep them like everything else? Quarterbacks don't sit long and they transfer, but that's part of the game. So you want to stockpile as many as you can, and whoever comes out on top is who comes out on top. Every program is pretty much in that boat. But yeah, I'll take that kid any day of the week. I know there – we'll go into specifics. There are a few other schools that are interested in him. I was actually talking to, about him with somebody yesterday that knows about his situation. They, there are other programs that would kind of like to get him, but they're they're in a tough spot. They have a guy that's kind of committed for them, et cetera. A lot of the back-behind-the-scenes stuff, it's, it's hilarious. So quarterback recruiting is always wild. Before we move on, it seems like for me, traditionally, Louisville has – and you you hit the nail on the head. I wouldn't even go as far as saying that Louisville's perennially an 8-10 to 10 win. You I know, think with Brom they can be as wise. I, that's I, mean, I was going to preface by saying that I think – He's Brom, really good on game day and prepping oh, for game day. He's tremendous. 100%. 100%. But one of the things that he sort of embodied, um, you know, the recruiting trends of – Louisville loves to get out in front of recruitments and take swings at players who they believe can traject up in the rankings, which, I mean, it feels like every program in Louisville stature sort of plays by those rules. It feels like Louisville is getting the nucleus of players in this class that they know they want for sure. And then when they've built up that group, taking swings at some of the larger name guys in this class that they're going after. That's kind of the norm. Um, yeah. When Florida State and Miami built their programs in the early 80s, they were nobodies when they first got rolling, and then they both kind of hit about the same time, Florida State just before. But you got to start somewhere. You, it's getting that first elite player, and then you really hope he's successful, and then the door opens. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, Louisville is not in the same situation that Miami is. I mean, an idiot can recruit to Miami. It's in Miami. But <laughs> – there's still this this whole thing about it's a city school, it's in a power five, it's had success, it's had a Heisman winner recently, et cetera. You can build something there, but it's just got to be more out of state. It's a little more uh, fly by night because they're going to have to get two kids from Texas, two kids from Virginia, three kids from Georgia. I mean, you know, they might get how many kids out of Kentucky? Three, four. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's it's just right. not a good state for prep football to no, translate not. to elite. It's just not. So, mm -hmm. and the state's never been loyal to the two in-state programs either. It's never been that way. Kids go to Michigan, Bama, wherever. So it's hard. But the good news is Louisville is still coming off an ACC title. They're doing well with the portal. They're, when was the last time you felt this good about the roster going into a season, especially exactly. after a good season? They're better than they were when Brom got, you know, when he got here. Oh, yeah, they're, they're a better team this year on paper than they were this time last year. The only difference is the schedule is a little bit more challenging than it oh, was. Oh, yeah, so. they got they caught the schedule real – Miami got the easy schedule this year. It, it just kind of rotates. Yeah, it flip-flops. I mean, ACC is not as as brutal as – even might it might, as, might have been, you know, even 10 years or so ago. But it seems like – you mentioned, I mean, you – to build up that program, you have to sort of build your nucleus in the class and, and take a couple swings at some guys that you might feel somewhat confident in. But um, e even if you miss out on those guys, it's not the end of the world because you do have that nucleus built up. We're going to discuss exactly. two of those players uh, coming up here in just a moment 
after we tell you about the title sponsor of the show, LinkedIn Jobs. Today's episode of the show brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tool to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's not just another job board. It helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else. Even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but they might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking at LinkedIn, you're in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire a professional like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Continuing on along on this special recruiting episode of the show with Locked On Podcast Network National Recruiting Analyst Brian Smith, two prospects that Louisville is keeping very close tabs on. Both of them made official visits to the program earlier this month. Brian, the first one, a player from your old stomping grounds, Carl Jenkins Jr., down in the Sunshine State, plays um, for St. Augustine High School in St. Augustine, sort of on that um, I don't know if you would call it northeastern corridor uh, yeah. of Florida, but it's outside of Grand 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 that area. Um, for starters, um, it always fascinates me the differentiation between the levels of competition. Um, I believe St. Augustine is 3S, if I'm not mistaken. They were can you, last year. Yeah, can They're you a good size, uh, but it's still not the biggest division. Yeah, can you sort of like uh, quickly paraphrase, you know, or, or summarize what that – competition how it ranks up in the grand scheme in florida s means suburban uh they take out the big city schools because like the miami public schools fort Lauderdale public schools and some of the private they just murdered everybody so they divisioned it differently last year right. they're going back to a more similar system again this year they change all the time in florida but suburban like lakeland mid-sized cities like that yeah. all competed and it was competitive, and they made it to the state finals. They had like four or five kids that are going to play receiver at the college level on one high school team, and their quarterback is going to go to USF. I mean, they threw it around. State of Florida, that's not a program that normally has kids, and they had like five guys. Right. Just one of those wild things, and he was their guy. If you go look up a picture of Carl, he looks like a kid that was starting at Florida State, like he's yoked. So this is the state yeah. of Florida. They have 40 receivers a year that go co play college football. Right. It's insane. And he's that guy. I knew about him a couple of years ago. The quarterback that's really go, going to USF, he told me he was the best of the bunch. And he makes the play where he takes it off your head. He's a special player in terms of his acrobatic ability. I, I don't think he's a 4'4 guy, but he's 6'2", 180 pounds, and he can run pretty well. And he's just more educated about how to be a receiver in body positioning than most kids his age. He makes special catches. And, and I mean – the stats speak for itself. I mean, I think oh, almost 1,200 yards, 15 total yeah. touchdowns. You mentioned the measurables there. Um, it looks like for Carl, he does have that commitment planned for the end of the month. There has been a lot of social media traction amongst the global commits. Obviously, can't put too much stock into social media trends, but um, it looks like at this point it might be Louisville and two in-state schools with Central Florida and, like you mentioned, South Florida also into the mix, all three getting official visits this um, this month before the decision. How do you feel realistically that Louisville sizes up in this recruitment? For whatever reason, Louisville does really well in Florida in general. I don't know what it is. It's been that way for a long time, but they seem to be a prominent program with them. I mean, UCF and USF, you can't count out, but that's not the same as Florida State in Florida. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I don't know. USF, though, his teammate, again, the quarterback, Unless something changed, that's where he's committed. So that might be something to think about. And a lot of Florida kids don't like to leave home when it gets down to it. But I, I don't think it's going to matter for him. That program that he's at doesn't get a lot of attention. They're kind of under the radar because they're a little bit south of Jacksonville. They get no media. He probably right. is looking to go make a splash somewhere. That would be my guess. So I would not be surprised at all if it's a legal. And I would, without much inside information here, it seems like reading the tea leaves – Jenkins is probably the top receiver on Louisville's board at the current moment, um, even though they do have a player sort of the same mold, taller, um, not the quickest, but 
utilizing that verticality in LeBron Hill, but Will was going to have to replace multiple receivers um, at the end of this season. So it doesn't surprise me that they're going to take multiple guys in this class. Another player uh, from a little bit up the road up in Georgia, I, I could be butchering this name. I believe it's Chaston Brown. Um, all Probably. Chaston, Chaston, um, intriguing, Brian, because this was his first season playing football. This past year, 6'7", he's listed at 240. He's probably going to not be 240 when he steps foot on a college campus. But another situation to where Louisville and Central Florida could very well be duking it out. He spent a, a weekend at UCF, got some crystal balls, and then all of a sudden takes a visit to Louisville. And it seems like those two schools at the current moment are, are going head-to-head -head, uh, from a player who I believe Warner Robbins is that outside of the Atlanta metro area. That is dead central. It's part of the state right on I-75. It is one of the perennial areas for talent per capita. Uh, there are three high schools there. Northside is the second best program in the area. See, that's pretty interesting because Louisville, it seems like, granted, it depends on the class, but there always has been an emphasis on Florida, but Georgia also gets a ton of love, especially since sure. Brom's come in. This class, this past class, the past two that he's had, multiple players from the state of Georgia, more specifically from Atlanta or sort of that, you know, 404 area. Sure. Just outside of the Metro. So, um, but a guy who's that highly rated already after only playing one season, it feels like that just doesn't happen a ton. It was interesting watching his film because when I, when I saw that he'd played one year, the first thing I thought was offensive tackles that have played one year are almost always the same terrible because it's all about technique he's been coached pretty well north side's a good program in warner robbins but like he's got good balance he's really long he fits the profile what you're looking at for an offensive tackle uh, i'm not saying he's the next joe alt who was a tight end in high school before he went to notre dame it was just a fifth pick but joe was like 250 going into his senior year they're almost the same size so that that stuff does happen now the question is how how, how easily can he not just add weight but can he feel comfortable with it? Because he's got great feet. He gets out in space on screens. He gets to the second level to take on linebackers. He's got an upside that's through the roof. I just don't know how much he's going to be able to add onto the frame. And that's that's the risk with these kind of kids. You just don't know. I do wonder your whole take on this. Do, do you think that he projects to be a, a tackle at the next level? No 100%. potential going to the interior? No, just No, no chance. He is an offensive tackle. Period. Gotcha. I just – with this one, it's pretty interesting because when Louisville and Central Florida are the two schools that, from the kid's mouth, it's Louisville and UCF at the moment, you would imagine that's that, that's probably a player from the Sunshine State. When you realize it's a player from the city of Georgia, Georgia probably hasn't come knocking yet. They might if they feel he's going to be good enough in some other SEC schools. But the offer sheet at the moment – it's not going to jump off the page here. There's some ACC flavor in there, um, but I am not sure that he has one singular SEC offer to date. So something that concerns me just a tad in this one for a guy so highly ranked, it, why are other SEC schools not pursuing this guy? I think it's just the size. Uh, as it relates to UGA, they take kids that are massive, and their program is different than any other because they run six to seven days a week. They take weight off instead of add weight. So he's not an option for them. Uh, also, you're looking at these other programs. They're trying to catch Georgia. They don't want kids that take a long time. The portal is where everybody wants alignment, although there are very few. They want kids that can play very early. He's probably not going to play much at all his first couple of years. But as a junior, by the time his body catches up, he could be six six and a half, three hundred eight 308 pounds, and be your starting left tackle at Louisville, too. They, these SEC schools don't want to wait that long. So it's a weird dynamic. I wouldn't put him into anything other than in the anomaly category. It's pretty interesting. And that would be a type of player that Louisville usually succeeds on the guys that get overlooked in the really talent rich areas that might not necessarily play early on. And then by year two, year three, hell, maybe even year four, sometimes they give you a, a good amount of production and, it's always nice to see Louisville go toe to toe with a school that is, let, let's face it, a better program 
than the Cardinals. And Louisville went up toe-to-toe with a very good program in Penn State and got a commitment from Josh Johnson. And we're going to talk about both of the most recent commitments from the state of Ohio here coming up momentarily. Also, I want to take this time to tell you about our friends over at FanDuel. Look, summertime means baseball, the NBA Finals, and more. Well, not the NBA Finals anymore. The Boston Celtics made a complete mockery of the Dallas Mavericks. But if you're a soccer fan, the Euro 2024 competition and the Copa America coming up here shortly. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on everything from the Finals MVP to who's going to hit one out of the park. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel remains America's number one sports book. Already into the final segment on this recruiting special with Locked On Podcast Network recruiting analyst Brian Smith. Brian, two commitments recently from Louisville. Jeff Brom has made it clear that if you are in the five-hour radius of the city of Louisville, there will be some attention there. Ohio's gotten a ton of attention pretty recently. Yeah, I think uh, the Ohio area is important for Louisville, even though you're not going to get a ton of the Ohio State kids. It still has a lot of guys. Penn State, Indiana, Michigan State, Notre Dame, a lot of schools go in there and get good players, Tennessee, Kentucky. Louisville should too, and they've done a good job of finding guys. I think the corner they just got in particular – He's very savvy, has great hands. He could play pretty early, and especially in today's era, Dalton. I mean, if you don't have a bunch of corners, you're in trouble. Uh, It's it's unbelievable how many teams can throw the football around. So they just got a really good one, and I'm kind of curious to see how they use him because I liked his film. Josh Johnson's a good football player. And it's interesting because he he plays both ways, as kids tend to do at the high school ranks. I'm interested to see whether he's going to be a, a guy that they put out wide or in their 4-2-5 base defensive package if they're going to put him in center field as sort of the MJ Griffin replacement. Does he sort of play that hybrid outside linebacker role that they throw out there? But, Brian, the main interesting thing for me is that, according to the Penn State insiders, they were ready for this kid to commit. Like the plan was that he was going to commit. And then all of a sudden in recruiting things change and Louisville comes in last minute. Now, whether or not that he's, you know, high up the priority list, they were at least comfortable enough to get him to commit. And then he switches on switches to Louisville quickly before that decision. I have to think that this is somewhat, maybe not an an elite win, but somewhat of a monumental recruiting victory over a, relatively blue blood program now penn state certainly has a lot of blue blood to them hey you you won the recruiting battle who cares you won the recruiting battle so yeah this is the kind of situation they need to build off of though even though it wasn't ohio state for an ohio kid it's still a really prominent program and they had the number one defense in the country last year and you just took a corner from them. that mm-hmm. has to say something so Louisville needs more kids like this I don't know if they're going to get more, but, I mean, it's a start. And Louisville fans that are complaining about the three stars and all, this is one of the kids that you should be like, okay, this kid can play. Hopefully he can come in and contribute by the end of his freshman year. You look at the offer sheet here, and I know that rankings are so volatile right now, especially right now in the summer, but where would you suspect that he might end up? Because as as it stands right now, he's barely inside of the top 900. The offer sheet in the film – just don't really kind of match what the ranking looks like at the moment. Is he a top 500 level guy, top 700? Where do you, where do you think he kind of ranks in? I think conservatively he's top 500. Uh, He has great hands. He plays mostly zone coverage at his high school. The only concern I have is something that's not his fault. I don't see him in bump and run coverage. I don't really like to rate corners unless I see a bunch of that. Can you flat out turn, be behind a kid and make it up? with your 40 speed or whatever you want to call it. I have no idea. That's the only thing I have that I'm not sure about, but the hands, the eye discipline, the ability to break on the ball, all those things are there. And he's pretty good tackler too. Physical kid. Most corners really aren't, to be honest. This is a football player that could play nickel. He could play outside. He could probably play free safety. Why, why wouldn't he be a top 500 kids? Kind of really the way I would look at it. Mm -hmm. It feels like Brahms defensive back recruiting MO is 
opting to go with larger players um, as opposed to Satterfield. It was more of your smaller but extremely quick. Braum has sort of changed that up, Ron English and company, going for a more uh, larger type of player. And it shows they got another defensive back from Ohio, this one from uh, a historically solid program in Archbishop Moeller uh, up in Cincinnati. Six foot two, 185. He might not necessarily be um, as highly regarded, but he's it's a higher ranking currently just inside of the top 800. But to get a player from Cincinnati, regardless, I feel like is a good start. Mower is a tradition rich program. They've got state titles going back into the 60s, 70s, what have you. Really, really good program. I don't know much about him. He doesn't have any junior film like you. I didn't see a ton of offers, but I looked at the measurables and I know what league he's in. Louisville also has access. What is it? An hour and 50 minutes between the two schools at that or two cities. They probably know him well. I'm not worried about them evaluating Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio players. They'll get those right because they're so darn close. I'd imagine he's been down to campus. They probably had a gun on him, and he's listed at 6'2". That's a kid that's, again, probably going to be able to play safety, probably going to be able to play nickel. I'm not worried about him at all, especially coming from Archbishop Moore. Awesome. I, I would wrap it up there, but you answered me on a question that I have when Louisville got a commitment from, at that time, an unranked linebacker in the state of Florida, who you were pretty, you had a lot of great things to say about. And two days after he commits, he jumps up about 400 spots in the rankings. That's Caleb Matalo. Um, Sort of kind of reiterate what you told me, because the film might be the most impressive film of any of Louisville's commitments thus far. When kids come out of Florida that are defensive players, automatically, barring something unforeseen, I expect it to be good. For whatever reason, the kids in Florida can run and they're aggressive, which is what you need to be able to do. And that's that's him. Louisville needs more speed on D. I mean, they've got a few guys, a certain defensive lineman in particular, that fit the, the profile that you're looking for if you're an NFL franchise. But this is a right. kid that can be a multiple spot guy. And he could probably play either inside spot at some point be play out over the overhang. He, he can do different things. So if Louisville wants to run a multiple defense, which they do, this is the kind of player you got to get. And the state of Florida is full of little two and three, a programs that kind of get overlooked with the Florida and Florida States of the world. Louisville's always got some of those guys. They should continue to do so. Don't worry about what they're doing. Recruit your own guys. And that's what they right. did. That's what I, I feel like. Because what, what one thing Louisville fans are doing right now is they're comparing recruiting with Kentucky. And Mark Stoops has sure. really made it a point of emphasis to get some guys and go up with Ohio State and some of these other name programs, four players in this state of Ohio, and they've won some of these battles. And they've gotten some larger uh, recruiting wins. And they haven't had – I mean, they've had pretty solid portal classes. But I, I feel like for the most part – it's just a matter of, of FOMO and the grass being greener for Louisville fans at this point. The the fans don't want to go to work without saying they did something better than Kentucky. That's all that is. That's exactly, oh, you know, you know it as good as I do. That, that's it. I, I don't worry about that stuff at all. <laughs> well, hopefully the next time Brian hops on the show, we break down another commitment. Um, this is going to be, like Brian said, a very busy two week stretch and college football recruiting, we will keep our ears to the ground, and hopefully some good news comes from that trend. But that's going to wrap up this Tuesday. Locked on Podcast Network, National Recruiting Analyst Brian Smith uh, joining the show. Brian, appreciate you joining. We'll see you right back here coming up very soon.